Our next presenter is going to discuss the reading of Paul's letters in the 21st century. Dr. Susan Garrett specializes in study of the New Testament writings in their social historical context. She is Dean and Professor of New Testament at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, where she has taught since 1995. Previously, Dr. Garrett taught at Yale Divinity School and at Emory University. She earned a PhD at Yale University, the Master of Divinity degree at Princeton Theological Seminary, and a Bachelor of Arts degree at Duke University. We won't hold that against her today. She has been a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Tübingen, Germany, and a Henry Luce III Fellow in Theology. She is the author of a number of scholarly articles and several books, including monographs on magic and the demonic in Luke Acts, on Mark's portrayal of Jesus as tested throughout his ministry, and on beliefs about angels in early Christianity and today. In her work as dean, Dr. Garrett is particularly interested in helping students learn how to listen generously and dialogue across religious and cultural dividing lines so that they can help churches and others discover ways to function better and serve more creatively and faithfully. Dr. Garrett is married to Jim Garrett, a Presbyterian pastor who coordinates volunteer response to disasters for the state of Kentucky and is the proud mother of two daughters, ages 18 and 23. Let's give a very warm welcome to Dr. Sue Garrett. Thank you. the people that are reflected in this conference and to Mr. Steve Schmidt whom I've had the pleasure of meeting today after many email exchanges over these last months uh, for your work in organizing this conference. I bring you greetings from Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary just a few miles from here uh, where Mr. Baylor Landrum Jr. was one of our trustees for many years. Um, we at, Lu at Louisville Seminary have many connections and long history with Second Presbyterian Church, and it is really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. We live in an era, as you know, when the Bible has less and less hold on people's lives. A 2009 book authored by Christian Smith and Melina Lundquist Denton entitled Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers explored what teens think about the role of religion in their lives and how much they actually know about religion or about their particular religious tradition. So Smith and Denton uh, surveyed uh, 3,000 young people, interviewed about 275 of them, uh, people, young people from across the religious spectrum, uh, a huge variety of denominations, racial ethnic profiles, um, and religion, so not just Christians, but also Jews and I believe Muslims as well. And what the authors found in this study was that even those teens who claimed to be religious in a surprisingly high percentage uh, were very favorable toward religion, uh, were actually unable to articulate much of anything substantive about the content of their belief or practice or to say why or how they did things the way they did or why they believed what they did. Really only, only the Mormon youth came out looking good in this. So Presbyterians, Methodists, all manner of Baptists, Episcopalians, Jewish youth, all of the above came out reflecting really quite shockingly little knowledge of their own religious tradition and scripture. Uh, on the other hand, Smith and Denton observed that although they show little familiarity with particular traditions, they do have a kind of default religious framework or doctrine, uh, what they call, uh, very tellingly, moralistic therapeutic deism. Now this particular doctrinal profile asserts that God exists, that's the deism, God wants us to be good, that's the moralism, and God is there to help us out when we need help. That's the therapeutic part. That's pretty much it. So in their practice of therapeutic moral, moralistic therapeutic deism, young people are, of course, reflecting what they're learning from their elders. They didn't make this up. They're getting it from the culture. So that makes me ask the question, why do people today 
know so little about religion and even less about the Bible. I think that one important reason has to be that they have not discovered or they have not been taught how engagement with the scriptures and with Christian tradition can be relevant, both for their individual lives and for the world at large. They're not seeing the relevance of it. In the 21st century, I think we need to make relevance a top concern for our interpretation and proclamation. Now, relevant does not mean simple, in my view. Moralistic therapeutic deism is simple. But I would say that it really isn't relevant because it fails to diagnose and to address the real problems that we are facing in our world. Faithful teaching of the New Testament in the 21st century must persuade people that the work of reading, all the, all the steps and the, and the tactics that we've heard described so well already this morning, that, that that work of reading is worth it. That in such reading, we discover not cheap platitudes, but answers to our most urgent questions. Our 21st century hermeneutic, in addition to asking how it is relevant, has to attend both, uh, so both to the context of the ignorance of the Bible that I've sketched and also to the context of the dominant postmodernist epistemology of our era, which asserts that interpretations vary depending on where we stand. I think that even Paul must have recognized that interpretations of his words would vary depending on where his readers stood. Um, First Corinthians, I think, serves as a great example of this phenomenon. Now, Paul was addressing uh, the problems of factions and divisions in that congregation, and uh, notably, he was addressing, I think, a division between folks whom he called the strong and other folks whom he identified as the weak. Well, so for most of the letter, he, he seems to really be directing his rhetoric, I think, at the strong, who were likely the wealthier and better educated among the church's members. In that highly status conscious and patriarchal, very hierarchical patriarchal society, the strong would have expected to be treated with greater honor and respect than the weak. Today, when a general in the army enters the room, all the soldiers stand up. I think that likewise the Corinthian strong probably expected, if not that, then some measure of deference from the slaves and the lowly in their church. So when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 24, that God gives greater honor to the weaker members of the body of Christ, I have to ask, how would the strong have heard that message? I think they would have seen it as an insult and a threat to the social order. The weak, on the other hand, would have heard Paul's teaching as a word affirming their full dignity, their full membership in the body. So my point is that where one stands affects how one reads. Reading well in the 21st century has to include deliberate efforts to overcome our own context blindness. How has our position as first world people addicted to our lifestyle and committed to a social order that, that favors us? How has that affected our reading of the text? We have to ask that question in order to, in order to overcome our context blindness. Up to and throughout most of the 20th century, practices of historical biblical criticism were touted as a means to help us read in a scientific and bias-free way. Historical criticism has indeed accomplished many things for us, and I consider myself a historical critic, so I'm not, I'm not trashing historical criticism, but I'm suggesting that although it has accomplished and helped us with many, many types of interpretation, helping us to see things that otherwise we would not have seen, the practitioners of historical criticism too have suffered from context blindness and have been driven by hidden agendas. Maybe no work of recent uh, scholarship makes this point more pointedly than the brilliant work by Susanna Heschel, the daughter of Abraham Heschel, 
uh, the book called The Aryan Jesus, in which she looks at how the entire discipline of New Testament scholarship in Germany around the Second World War was co-opted by a move to demonstrate that Jesus wasn't even Jewish, but rather was Aryan, and to separate uh, Christianity from its Jewish uh, background. So I'm not advocating that we abandon critical interpretive methods, but rather that we reinvigorate them by becoming aware of our own context blindness and addressing agendas that are explicit rather than hidden and that are also relevant to the needs of the world. Now, I'm at the place in my outline, if you're looking at that, where I, uh, with the heading, Paul, an unlikely bearer of good news for the 21st century. There are, I think, a number of reasons why Paul is not a very likely candidate for favorite biblical author in the 21st century. Uh, so Dr. Pennington was talking about how we can't let Paul dominate everything. I'm suggesting Paul isn't really even getting that much of a reading for the most part today. I think that some of the reasons for this are ancient reasons. The author of 2 Peter described the letters of our beloved brother Paul as hard to understand. What seminary student doesn't agree with that? He said they are readily twisted by the ignorant and unstable to their own destruction, 2 Peter chapter 3. So this author is stating what generations of seminary students and others of us have discovered, that interpreting Paul's letters is really tough. There are several reasons, I think, for this. One, they're written in Greek. Two, the epistles give us mere snapshots of one side of complex and ongoing conversations. Three, there are countless missing pieces of information. And four, Paul is guided by rhetorical and epistolary patterns that have only recently begun to be discerned. And I think here's a place where historical criticism has really moved the, the, the marker down the road. Uh, I do think that in, in recent decades, people working on genre type studies of Pauline material have gained significant insight into uh, ways in which Paul is actually reflecting rhetorical and epistolary patterns that would have been known to his readers. And when we see those, we understand them better. But, but most of those findings are not very readily accessible to a wide public. So it's not only, though, the density and complexity of Paul's letters that, that I think make them look unpromising for today's readers. The content of his message also seems incompatible with many current sensibilities making it hard for the letters even to get a hearing. I can think of at least three sorts of incompatibility between the letters of Paul and the spirit of this age. And I'm just going to be mentioning these rather quickly. Any one of them could, could take us into a very lengthy discussion. Um, nor am I taking a stand on any of these. I'm simply saying these are places where the popular reading of Paul is very much out of kilter with current sensibilities, and that then shuts people down to being willing to really listen to or delve into Paul's writings. First, there is Paul's seemingly hierarchical view of the social order. In several of the letters, which may or may not have been written by him, I in fact believe that one of his followers may have written some of these letters, but in these letters ascribed to Paul, there's an insistence that both women and slaves keep their places within the household. Wives, be subject to your husbands, we read in Ephesians chapter 5, and slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. African-American theologian Howard Thurman reported how his grandmother, once a slave, refused to hear the letters of Paul read aloud because of the way that that slave owner's minister had used them to keep slaves in their place. We could also talk about the passages ascribed to Paul that, uh, that uh, suggest that women must be silent in church. So these kinds of uh, uh, affirmations of a particular social hierarchy um, are out of sync, I think, with much of the current sensibility of our day and thereby uh, just close people's minds to reading Paul. Second, Paul's generally favorable view of government is also out of sync with the anti-institutional bias of our day. Paul's respect for the powers that be comes to its most pointed expression in Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 7 where Paul writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. Those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Here Paul is uh, taking Old Testament teachings 
that human rulers are subject to the sovereignty of God in a direction that many today are unwilling to accept, having seen uh, too many cases where governments deceived and did wrong. So Paul is read as too politically conservative for many in our day. Third, Paul shared in first century Jewish cultures disdain for same-sex sexual relationships, which as Luke Johnson points out, Paul viewed as the perfect example of a specifically Gentile vice. Now it's true that in the pivotal passage in Romans 1, Paul was using homosexuality merely as an illustration of the larger problem of idolatry, uh, or of what Paul uh, viewed as uh, what happens when one exchanges the truth about God for a lie. So I think a responsible hermeneutic has to take this literary function of the passage, as well as Paul's formation by a particular cultural context, into account. It has to ask a lot of tough questions about how we, uh, what hermeneutic we apply to these kinds of passages in light of also later experience and perception. Uh, um, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into that. I've actually written an article on that that's available in, uh, the, on the website, The Thoughtful Christian, if you're interested in more. My point here is just to say that Paul's arguments are clearly out of favor in a country where I think at last count 36 states have legalized gay marriage. Having a little problem here. Uh, so for these and probably many other reasons, Paul doesn't seem to be a very promising font of wisdom or gospel for our day. In my view, a strategy for showing Paul's relevance in the 21st century probably cannot ignore the foregoing issues. They're, they're there, they're pe things people are interested in them, we have to keep talking about them. But we also shouldn't expect to make a lot of headway in spreading the gospel through these particular problems. No matter which side of the culture wars one is on, I don't think you can parse these passages, uh, the passages relevant to these issues that I've named finely enough or persuasively enough to gain and hold ground. It's a, just a never-ending struggle to make your point. And I think that in fact in trying to gain and hold ground, we're wasting time but when, when time's a-wasting, uh, we, we, we are in an urgent period, the church is in decline, people are not getting the word of God. We need to find ways to reach people with issues and with approaches that speak to people's genuine needs and to the world's genuine needs. So when we Christians look at the world, how do we know that what we are identifying as a problem is, is a real problem and not just a symptom? That's a question. I remember an incident when I was in history class in 10th grade. My teacher was Mr. Feldman. He was using the old-fashioned overhead projector. Uh, but a jokester from the class before had wadded up some pieces of paper and I don't know how, some put them in by the wires or something. So Mr. Feldman is talking away and all of a sudden, you know, smoke starts coming out of the overhead projector. Uh, well, he became very flustered and didn't really know what to do. I thought, well, I know what to do. I went over and called the office on the intercom phone actually not that great of a thing to do. What are they going to do, right? Another student went looking for a fire extinguisher. But Muffy Barrett, Muffy Barrett, a diminutive girl with a, with a very powerful mind, calmly walked over to the wall and pulled out the plug. The flames in the projector died out before the office responded or before a fire extinguisher could be applied. So by looking through the lens of science, Muffy identified the real problem. And I would suggest that for us as Christians to identify the world's real problems, we have to look at the broken places through the lens of the gospel. That is what good pastors do when they prepare to preach every week. They peer through the gospel lens to help us as congregants make sense of our hurts and our failings as well as our hopes and our dreams. When we try to identify the world's real problems, we won't come to perfect agreement. Yet our ideas may converge around some common themes. And I believe that Paul can speak to real problems that we face in this historical moment at the beginning of the 21st century, and can do so in profound and life-changing ways.
So now I'm in the place in your outline the apostle speaks to the world's most pressing problems. The first problem I want to talk about is consumerism. Our economy depends on ever-rising levels of spending. This relentless, society-wide, hurricane force drive to acquire goods and services correlates with ideological commitments that verge on religious, as Del DeChant observed in his 2008 book on religious dimensions of consumer culture. DeChant argued that in form and function, consumerism is entirely analogous to cosmological religions of past and present. And he particularly looked at phenomena around Christmas and even around Santa Claus and ways that these patterns really are so similar to uh, the rituals and myths of uh, various religions. Um, that these rituals and patterns drive people into non-rational patterns of behavior, specifically consumption in this case. So consumerism has many disastrous social and ecological consequences, including global warming, devastating greed at the highest levels of power. You might think here of Enron or of the mortgage lending debacle. And countless lives wasted in striving after goods that people don't really need. I believe that many people today sense that there's something wrong with this picture. Deep down, they know that they are being, that they are being tossed to and fro by desires for stuff, or by desires for better stuff, or desires for the best stuff. Deep down, they feel trapped, I think, by the unyielding grip that this desire to consume has on them, and by the huge sums they spend on things that will bring only fleeting pleasure. And if you think, well, I don't make enough money to fall into that category, I just ask, have you ever spent a few days obsessing about what cell phone you needed to buy? Maybe you have. So they are driven, I think, or sense this, this, uh, this sort of grip that consumerism has on them, they may be aware that their consumption is a source of the world's uh, ecological deterioration or by a knowledge that there are human beings who lack clean water or enough to eat and whose lives will never improve without intervention from those who have more. But I suggest that all of these ill effects that I'm describing that are related to consumerism and maybe consumerism itself are actually not the real problem but symptoms of the real problem. And the real problem, the problem that we see through the lens of the gospel, I suggest, is idolatry. And idolatry is a topic on which Paul's teaching is profound. Idolatry, Paul teaches, is what happens when we seek to ground our existence in created things, rather than putting our trust in the living God. Whenever we trust in lesser created objects or uh, created beings, we become alienated from the living God who alone is the source of our life. Created things are dead or subject to death. Only God is alive and can make alive. The powers and principalities in the religion of consumerism seek our loyalty, they seek our dollars, but they deliberately conceal the, deep, the steep demands that they make of us. The ultimate demand exacted by these false gods is enslavement of persons to ever greater desires and alienation from the living God. Idolatry is such an old-fashioned word, isn't it? We've pretty much lost it from our vocabulary, I think. But in losing this word, idolatry, from Christian vocabulary, we, we've also lost the capacity to diagnose the real problem. We've become slaves and we don't even know it and we don't know why. In Paul's reasoning, we all serve some power in life. The only question is which one? Will we serve a power that sets itself up in place of God, promising life but delivering at best emptiness and at worst death? Or will we serve the Christ with whom we can be raised to new life? and set free from the bonds that have held us captive. When we seek to ground our lives in the things that we can buy 
or indeed in any created thing, then everything gets distorted. We need the word idolatry, I think, in order to be able to discern that distortion. The gods of consumerism are actually but one of the classes of idolatrous powers that can lure us into bondage. False gods are everywhere because by nature we are God-making beings. That's kind of what we do. As a society, we lift up a whole pantheon of gods, gods of national security, gods of economic dominance, gods of racial superiority, gods of patriarchy, gods of heteronormativity, and more. And as individuals, on a personal level, we give our allegiance to gods of wealth and youth and beauty, thinness, seductiveness, sexual prowess, athletic accomplishment, and more. None of these things is necessarily bad in itself. But when we get to the point where they control the ways that we order our time, our thoughts, our spending, then they've ceased to be inanimate and have come to life as our gods, the way the golden calf became a god to the Hebrews. But Paul proclaims that when we give ourselves over to Jesus' lordship, none of these idols has control over us anymore. Only love is lord or master over us. And in the service of the love of Christ, we find our true freedom. Theologian Sally McFaig agrees with Augustine's insight into the human desire for God. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. McFaig writes, it's all right to be excessive. One can't love God too much. It's a relief to finally find the proper object of insatiable desire. Brothers and sisters, Paul teaches us that Christ can end our bondage to the false gods that beckon on every side, and that is good news for the 21st century. The second problem that I want to talk about is loneliness, which is a problem as old as humanity, but more prevalent perhaps than ever. How can, how can one measure these things? But certainly it seems to be as prevalent, if not more prevalent than ever, in this age of virtual reality, hypermobility, and short-term unstable work environments. Loneliness brings many harms in its wake, including rampant depression, high rates of addiction, crime, workaholism, suicide, and widespread inability to form interpersonal bonds that endure through the inevitable trials of life. As William Stringfellow wrote more than 50 years ago, and I'm quoting, loneliness is as intimate and as common to human beings as death. Stringfellow observed, incidentally, going back to the consumerism argument, how the ubiquity of loneliness drives consumerism as vendors dream up ever new ways to fill the voids of time and the absences of companionship that we experience. Vendors, and I'm quoting again, traffic in boredom and profit in one way or another from promising that time will be consumed for those who pay the price. But none of these strategies that humans invent to stave off loneliness actually has the power to fix the problem, which Stringfellow argues is a foretaste of death itself. When we are lonely, we are in essence, he argues, anticipating the ultimate loneliness of death, of our own death and that of others. Now, he, so this connection between loneliness and death, I think, is, is a way to see what, how Paul answers the problem of loneliness because, Paul, loneliness because Paul talks, of course, extensively about death. He's adamant that for those who are in Christ, death does not have the last word. In Colossians 3.3, we read, For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. In our dying with Christ, through our baptism and our being raised up with him to new life in God, we achieve victory over the shadow of death that besets us in our loneliness. Like the ancient Buddha encountering Mara, the evil one, we can say, I see you, Mara, and invite him in for tea, for we recognize 
that he is but a reflection of the craving and fear which lives in our own hearts, but to which we need no longer be enslaved. We are free to love God and to love ourselves and to do so in ways, as Stringfellow writes, that are neither suicidal nor destructive, neither jealous nor possessive. On the contrary, our love of ourselves, and I'm quoting again, will enable, embody, enrich, and elucidate our love for others. And our other loves will do the same for our self-love. We are free to enjoy God's presence and our very loneliness, our very aloneness, will become paradoxically a sign that we have died with Christ and that we have lives that are hid with him in God. A sign, in other words, of grace. This divine liberation of us, liberation from the oppression of loneliness in order to love God and neighbor more fully, more truly, is indeed good news for the 21st century. And the third real problem that I want to talk about today, the Saturday before our honoring of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is racism. Racism, I suggest, should be viewed as one of the powers and principalities of our world. So before I say more about racism specifically, I want to, I want to give a bit of explanation of this notion of powers and principalities which maybe, not a con maybe isn't a concept that's second nature to some of us here. The Apostle Paul, like other New Testament authors, believed that unseen forces are working in the world. But whereas the Gospel authors wrote about demons and unclean spirits and occasionally about angels, the Apostle wrote mostly about principalities, powers, authorities, rulers, kings, angels, demons, spirits, thrones, and dominions. In using these terms, he seems to have been referring at times to heavenly or spiritual realities, at times to earthly office holders or structures of power, and at times to both heavenly and spiritual realities. And I stand in a, a tradition of reformed interpretation which argues that uh, one must keep both of these dimensions in mind, that the powers and principalities have a spiritual aspect, but they also always have a material or embodied aspect in this world. And we do well to keep both of those together as we read passages and as we think about the powers that be in our own world. Today, some Christians stress the invisible spiritual side of the powers and principalities and downplay or ignore their worldly dimension. But as I've mentioned, the Reformed tradition, which includes Presbyterianism, I'm thinking here particularly of authors like Hendrikus Burkhoff and William Stringfellow and uh, more recently Walter Wink, that this tradition has insisted that we keep the powers earthly human element in view. Seen this way, Paul's language about powers and principalities does not refer exclusively to spirit beings, uh, but also to social entities and norms for behavior. I'm going to repeat those, social entities and norms for behavior. The principalities and powers are the institutions and ideologies, the rulers and the rules that order our existence and keep chaos at bay. So in this reform perspective, the powers and principalities are not to be uh, dismissed as somehow all evil and all of Satan, for they are the very structures that make us not fall into the abyss of chaos. The, the governments, the, the rules, the norms, the the, the practices and processes all help us to order our world. Um, so rules and rulers are all, I'm still continuing on kind of just an explanation of powers and principalities. Rulers and rules are often intended for good, as is the case with legitimate governments, the medical establishment, a family, a college honor code, the Geneva Conventions, you could name any one of hundreds and thousands even of of rules and rulers. Uh, but in the reform view, all worldly powers are prone to sin, or as my colleague Stephen Ray likes to say, or my former colleague Stephen Ray likes to say, all powers and principalities participate in the fall. 
They are all created, and therefore they are all fallen, maybe to differing degrees, but they're all fallen. So even powers with good intentions at times put selfish goals such as profit or pleasure ahead of the interests of God or fellow humans, or they seek to enhance their own position at others' expense. These, the various social institutions that have supported racism fall into this category from Jim Crow laws to judicial systems that permit disproportionate arrest and incarceration of people of color to the exclusionary provisions based on race that, although unenforceable, are still attached to some real estate deeds in Louisville, Kentucky, to the pernicious cultural expectations spread through, via countless social and cultural channels uh, for what people of color can or cannot achieve. And I'm here thinking of a, of a younger uh, uh, Barack Obama. This is kind of a variation on this story that we heard from Dr. Pennington, but with a kind of more unhappy sort of aspect to it. A, a, a younger tuxedo-wearing Barack Obama who was mistaken for a waiter at a gala. And I've just read a few days ago about current college students who report having been taken for custodians by their classmates who cannot expect that such a person would be on this campus. Uh, the, the fallen powers typically blind us to their true nature. The God of this world, Paul wrote, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We absorb and reflect the corrupting influences of our social and cultural worlds, including its racist components, because our family, peers, and cultures have, been, have blinded us to our own privilege, convincing us that certain classes of people deserve lesser treatment and that their victimization is less worthy of outrage. We, sit, we sin in these ways because forces larger than we are blind us, deceive us, and subjugate us. The powers draw us into sin and take us captive. The blinding and the overpowering don't alleviate our guilt, however. We are still accountable before God for our actions, both as individuals and as members of sinful communities whose biases and perversions we learn, act on, and pass on to others. This is what theologian Hendrik Burkhoff calls the tragic dimension of sin. Because of it, our guilt is lessened, but it is not removed. The powers prevailed upon us, but we gave our consent. I think of a story here by my doctoral dissertation advisor, Dr. Wayne Meeks. He tells of a time in Alabama when he was a four-year-old boy, so this was probably 75 or 80 years ago, uh, when he, his best playmate was a, a, a little uh, black boy. And um, at, at one point they got into an argument and Wayne recalls that he used the N-word and he said he remembered, remembers to this day that boy's face falling. And at that moment, Wayne says, he knew that he had stepped over a line. Was he, was he guilty? He's a four-year-old boy. He's learning and passing on and acting out things that he's learned from the culture around him. And yet, even at that tender age, he knew that somehow he had crossed a line. So full and final redemption from the fallen powers that blind us and subjugate us will not come until the last day, as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. But there is good news even today, because at his resurrection, at his resurrection Jesus became first fruits of the coming redemption and Lord over the powers. He is the one seated at God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. In his life as the risen one, Christ is able to reach beyond the confines of his former physical body and to be present via the Holy Spirit in the minds and hearts of all of us. Through the Holy Spirit, all of us experience his transforming knowledge, power, and love. As, one, as ones who call upon Christ's name, we share 
in his power. We share in Christ's power. But it's not firepower. It's not power to dominate, power to destroy. It's resurrection power, which is to say power to create, power to endure, power to bridge, power to forgive, power to love. It's this, it is the very power of life. Such power, freely given, is God's answer to the problem of racism and every other principality and power that would blind and alienate us from God and from one another. Christ frees us from the dominion of the powers and shows himself to be their Lord. And I'm going to suggest four ways that, that Christ sh frees us from the power and sh powers and shows uh, himself to be their Lord. First, by healing our blindness. Jesus gives us eyes to see when sin seduces us with its wily and deceptive promises. Second, by undergirding us when death, the forces of death, torment and buffet us. We conquer our fear by trusting in the God who raises the dead and by drawing on the strength conferred by the Holy Spirit. Third, by forgiving us when we fail morally, by accepting us, even running to meet and embrace us when we are dragged down with shame. Christ enables us to triumph over the forces that tempt us to despair. And fourth, by empowering us to love and to serve people whom we have wronged or whom we have hated or people who have hated us. Christ enables us to forgive those who have wronged us and to call these wrongs to mind no more. These powers conferred on us by Christ, powers to see the fallen principalities for what they are and to deny them our ultimate allegiance, even as in certain circumstances we support them, in their proper function. This power to conquer our fears and forgive ourselves and others when we fail, this power to love our enemies, these are the true powers that, that can combat racism and its devastating effects in our world. And that is good news for the 21st century. So, what kind of leaders will we be in light of the gospel that Paul preaches. I've just finished teaching a week-long course to Doctor of Ministry students on the Bible and Christian leadership. So I'm thinking very much about leadership. And I embrace all of you in that category of leaders, whatever your occupation. I know all of you are devoted to your faith and in some, ma some manner le leaders in your communities. Consumerism, loneliness, and racism are, are clearly not the only real problems that we face in the 21st century. And maybe you have even been wondering why I chose to discuss these three issues and not other issues that I could have named. I suggest that the three problems I have highlighted are all interrelated in as much as all stem from human bondage to created entities that are not God. In other words, they are all species of idolatry, which I, I do see as the real problem of our day and the source of virtually every other problem that we confront as a, as a society and even as a church. We succumb to, to consumerism, to loneliness, or perhaps we could speak here of alienation, uh, and to racism because forces larger than us blind us and entice us to put our trust in lesser beings rather than in the God of life who alone can set us free and make us whole. Paul shows us that Christ liberates us from our bondage to all such lesser beings. The deceit ends and we are free to serve God and to work for the flourishing of God's people. So what kind of leaders shall we be in light of the, this gospel that Paul preaches? 
certainly we can and should invite people to read Paul's letters in ways that are both wider and deeper than is the norm in popular Christian culture today. We can reintroduce them to Paul's message about God's claim on our lives, the word about the propensity of lesser deities disguised as goods and services and privileges to lure us away from God and into bondage. We can talk and teach people, and I hope we do do these things, about uh, uh, Paul's reassurances that Christ answers our insatiable desires and is present to us always, that Christ empowers us to love those who are different from us. But even more, then by reading or teaching Paul in new ways, we lead best, I believe, when we embody, when we incarnate the gospel of Christ's liberating presence in our very lives. And here I close with one of my favorite verses from scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Uh, yes. Thank you for that. Um, how would you, if you're going to explain somebody to somebody in just passing, like say you're on an elevator, how would you summarize for that elevator person what is the gospel that Paul preaches? I think that I have to keep coming back to idolatry. The gospel that Paul preaches is that God empowers us to be freed from all of the lesser beings and forces in this world that hold us captive and keep us from both giving God the honor that God is due and living our lives to the fullest. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm a Baptist pastor, and um, probably among Baptists here, I would probably say I'm more egalitarian than other Baptists here. I'm just going to guess. And um, within my own congregation, I often sense that I'm probably more politically progressive. Um, and so, without your outline, when I preach Paul, uh, I, and also with a good reading, heavy dose of um, Stringfellow, I find myself just drawing from Paul teachings on consumerism and loneliness and uh, string fellows dealing with uh, principalities and powers. Um, now, if I would say my fellow Baptist pastors who are complementarian, more politically conservative, they're going to deal with those passages from Paul but I, almost, I feel like maybe you're telling me to avoid them, you know, d I'm, answering I'm, questions on hierarchy right. and political questions. Do I avoid those things, or do you deal with them? Um, I think that the extent to which you deal with them probably depends on your context and how much these are at issue or sources of, of controversy or distractions from making, keeping the, real, the main thing the main thing. I think that, that my view is that they can be distractions and keep us from keeping the main thing the main thing. In your context where your colleagues are very concerned about these matters, you probably do need to deal with them. You need to be um, able to exegete relevant passages um, and to have discussions that take their views very seriously but that also articulate well your own views. Um, so I don't think that I'm saying that we never have those conversations. Um, but rather that we make sure that we don't miss the forest for the trees and that we keep, uh, keep our eyes focused on this word about, about Christ to us and our lives being hid with Christ in God and what that means then for the way we live our lives in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garrett. That was a very, very good 
uh, discussion. My question is, um, what resources would you recommend to begin to explore the idea of principalities and powers in Paul? Well, um, I, uh, this is embarrassing. I would suggest you might look at a book that I wrote. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I wrote a book called No Ordinary Angels, Celestial Spirits, and Christian Claims About Jesus. It was published by Yale University Press in 2008. Um, and I have a chap two chapters in there, one on that is called Falling Angels, and the other one is called Satan and the Powers. And so those will give you um, an overview of some of some, some various perspectives. So I deal with reformed perspectives. I also deal with um, the dispensationalist perspective uh, exhibited in the Left Behind novels. I talk about spiritual warfare. So I'm looking at a range of ways that people have made sense of this biblical language and trying to find a way through that. Um, but if you want to read a classic book, and you want, especially if you want to try Stringfellow, um, I recommend his little book, Instead of Death, which is a, a very small book, remarkably profound, and parts of it you can't even believe were written 50, 50 years ago because they seem so very pertinent for today. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Garrett, as the father of a adult lesbian daughter, how can I reach out to folk uh, containing my anger, maybe at their lack of understanding, and yet uh, try to convey something of what my daughter has gone through, but also something of the blessedness of her lives, her life, and the lives of others uh, in her uh, sexuality. Is your daughter a, a churchgoer or has she well, gone away from the church? Well, she's felt that the church has uh, either kept her out or has pushed her away. Right. Uh, which, is, which is sad. Right. She lives in Minneapolis, which is a, a much more open city maybe than some of our southern right. cities. Right. But uh, she still, I think, feels this alienation. Right. I mean, I feel for you because I, I have known many gay and lesbian uh, people who have suffered in this way, who um, have been turned away from the, from the church entirely because of the kinds of exclusion that they've experienced and right. the kinds of judgment that they have felt. Um, and so I think my first concern would be for your daughter and just encouraging her to keep looking because there are people out there who, who can see uh, the, that, that God loves all people, all of God's children. Um, in terms of society, um, it's, a, it's a tough battle. I think that, uh, you know, I talked about, I mean, there I am using the battle metaphor, and I suggested let's, let's try to get away from that. And yet still, because this uh, situation continues where people are being told that they're not precious to God uh, because of, of their sexuality, um, I, we, it is, a, it is a, a, something that we do need to continue to attend to. Um, and so I think there, um, it's being clear about your own beliefs and your own convictions about God's blessing of God's children, um, and also having some familiarity with uh, some of the texts that are regularly brought into this conversation, and um, some familiarity with, with other ways of framing the discussion which get out of that very strict binary, either for or against. So I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you later about some of those resources. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.